uh, rodenticides are found in these intact forests. Uh, a lot of our correlation in, uh, that we're finding is related to trespass marijuana cultivation sites on public and uh, uh, public lands, private lands, as well as tribal lands. Uh, so the the marijuana cultivators that have been utilizing this these products are utilizing this specifically during the springtime. So that's when the seedlings are out there. There's a high growth rate, sugar content uh, for the plants, as well as the water content. And they're placing it uh, to protect these seedlings from uh, rodents that would actually uh, chip away at the clones or the seedlings um, and store the plants for themselves. So they're lining these um, the plants themselves uh, in addition to that to protect the plants but also uh, putting the rodenticide products out at their campsites and where their food caches are to keep rodents from damaging their food uh, since they, uh, the cultivators will stay out here from as early as February to as late as October. It's not just the illegal use of these, uh, these pesticides or uh, the purchase of them, but it's also what's occurring is folks that are bringing in restricted use pesticides that can only be purchased by a pesticide applicator uh, license, but also banned chemicals. So chemicals that have been banned in United States, Canada, the European Union. So we're talking about DDE, DDT, as well as carbofurin and furidan, so carbamates as well, that are being brought in and utilized. And those are being placed on plants, as well as being used to deter wildlife, such as fishers or other species, to either raid their food caches that they're storing here or protect their plants as well. Uh, and a good example of that was last year in July 2013, uh, our science team was able to walk in on a raid and we found a fisher that died from a carbamate that was uh, a restricted use pesticide laced hot dog. So they were maliciously, intentionally trying to poison wildlife to protect their plants. Let's just say a fisher were to come across a marijuana cultivation site. If that fisher came across and were to find either the rodenticide itself or find debilitated prey species, so a wood rat or a gray squirrel or a flying squirrel debilitated from these anticoagulant rodenticides, number one, the prey species can survive for three to up to seven days. So it, it allows that accessibility for a fisher to consume exposed prey items. That fisher would consume it, be exposed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the fisher is going to definitively die from that exposure, but it now has a level uh, that is basically similar to a, um, an empty glass. It's filling up slowly with these uh, anticoagulant or filling up slowly with water. And then when it hits to that very top of that lid, it basically spills over. And when that occurs, that's when that fisher, uh, without immediate interjection of supportive care, such as uh, vitamin K injections, that fisher is going to succumb to the exposure levels and die. If a fisher were to disappear from this, um, from this landscape, um, it's, it's been well documented um, in so many different studies when you remove a, a predator, a meso predator or uh, an apex predator, that you, you basically are removing uh, a, a very important cog in, uh, in the machine where the machine basically, our ecosystem will fail and they'll, it slowly will degrade or it just will fail right off the bat. So it's key and essential to have a mesopredator as a fisher uh, be uh, um, at stable population levels uh, because either for prey species um, and as well as other species, uh, they're, they're a key component in this uh, uh, system.